Okay, we're live. Uh, it's good to be here with with Kevin Curry Knight. Uh, Kevin, thanks for the, taking the time to be here with us. Oh, no problem, Kelly. How you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, quarantine's treating you okay? It's treating me all right. I don't usually don't not rock in the beard, but uh, you know, it's with the quarantine. There's just no point. Why would you shave? <laughs> exactly. No it point. works. Uh, I I find myself on uh, webcam basically all day, so uh, it's, it's definitely changing the. Changing the world for me, although our, our company's already remote, but now I don't even have any in-person meetings like I used to. You know, it'll be really interesting to see what all of this does to organizational places, whether it's schools or businesses or whatever, because I imagine that a lot of them will realize that you can do more online than you thought you could. So and efficient. just pushed it. Yeah. But then I also imagine that there's going to be businesses that realize, holy, you know, holy moly, we thought that we could do a lot of stuff online. And it turns out that there are face-to-face -face things that we can't replicate as well as we thought. So I think it'll go both ways. I just don't know what that mix yeah. is going to be. It, it's actually a really interesting question and, and and very relevant to what we're doing with Prenda because right now, you know, we have these micro schools, 10 kids meeting in a house. Um, yeah. That's a, a very impressive, like a, it's a warm fostering learning environment where, but it, part of that is fueled by that human interaction. And so to try yeah. to move that to an online, it's definitely been easier than, you know, my friends who are, are shifting a full kind of 30 kid classroom model to yeah. Zoom or something. Um, you know, we didn't have lectures, for example, anyway. So it's it's easier for kids that are self-guided to do that at home. Um, yeah. But yeah. there's a question like you're talking about is how important is it to you know, high five somebody after you figure something out or just ask yeah. a question over your shoulder as opposed to. Yeah. I mean, a... I'm in somewhat of the same boat because I'm on the board of directors of the Pathfinder Community School in Durham, North Carolina. And it's um, a school that follows the Agile Learning Center model. So there's really no formal forced curriculum. Uh, really, the curriculum is like people being together in the same space and kids get to do what they want with their time. And what we've really noticed, because with the quarantine, like all other schools, we kind of try to go online what we've noticed is that it would be way easier to go online. If you're a school that is like a traditional school, you have lectures. Cool. You can put them online. You have activities. Right. Cool. You can put them online with us. It's we have online offerings, but it's really hard to replicate because most of the stuff that we do requires people being in the physical space together. So, you know, we could replicate, let's say our morning meetings online. Yeah. But what are you going to have a morning meeting about if you're not in a space? Because usually the morning meetings are about what should the rules be for the space? What are we going to do? Out. You, you really can't do that if everyone's at home. So it's it's almost an irony. It's like it's this crazy. is getting us to realize that we would have probably had an easier time if we were a conventional school because you can just roll over a lot of stuff. So uh, interesting. Yeah. Well, Kevin, let's get let's get into it. The um the topic of the day is why I learn and you were recommended by some friends, some mutual friends. You and I have never oh, met before, but yeah, recommended no. as somebody who learns. Uh, I was curious to hear the beginnings of your story as not maybe standing out as somebody who was perceived <laughs> as a learner in, in school. And That's maybe right. you could start there and kind of just share a little bit about your story. That's right. So um, I guess to preface, I am a professor and a, a teaching associate professor in a college of education at East Carolina University. Um, I have two master's degrees and a PhD and have published a text with an academic press. And I say that not to brag, but to preface the conversation by saying that when I was in high school, um, it became really evident that I did not like school. I didn't like any part of it. And it's funny when I talk to my parents about this, because I'm trying to trace out, you know, did I really, did I hate school? Was I ambivalent? And they said, you know, Kevin, you never liked it. You never, that we never recall any times where you like really seemed like excited about like learning stuff in school. It was always, for me, it was always something I got out of the way as quickly as I could just because I wanted school to stay off my back. Um, so my junior year in high school was really the worst. Um, I started skipping a lot of school. I met some friends who I would skip school with and occasionally I would skip school kind of on my own too. And by about uh, three quarters of the way through the year, I was rocking a 1.3 GPA out of four <laughs> point. And um, I'd skipped missed, but primarily skipped 40 and a half days out of a 180 some day school year. And my parents found out eventually, and I put a lot of effort into skipping. Um, I just, again, I, not because I wanted to like, you know, thumb my nose at, at the system, but because I just wanted it to stay off my back. And um, they finally caught me and they brokered a deal with the school 
kind of against my will, probably. Um, if you if Kevin finishes all of the major assignments, we will give him a chance to pe- to pass in the senior year. And I had made up my mind: if I don't pass into senior year, I'm dropping out. There's no way I'm going to go back and do my senior year again. Anyway, long story short, the only college I wanted to get into is Berkeley College of Music, which is a music college um, in Boston, Massachusetts. And one of the way the things I did when I skipped school, ironically enough, is um, I would play drums obsessively. Like I went home and I subscribed to this magazine called Modern Drummer Magazine, and they had you know articles about drummers, product reviews, drum charts, like all here's here's the latest songs and transcribed for the for drum set. And I would learn those songs and I would like play it. I had a tape recorder, so I would press record. I would record it, go back, listen to it, make a, a mental note of all the things I did wrong, <laughs> go back, play it again, et cetera. And, you know, the irony of that is then you go into your, your meetings with parent teacher stuff and it's, well, you know, Kevin just isn't applying himself. <laughs> and of course, like, I don't think I thought of it at the time, but it's like, that's kind of weird because I am applying myself. I'm just not applying myself to the stuff. That you yeah. want me to apply it. So anyway, I get into Berkeley College of Music. Same kind of story. I, first of all, extreme academic probation. They only accepted me on very, very high academic probation. Uh, I got through that, but similar story. Every year, you notice a decline in my grades. And let's face it, it's a music college. It's accredited, so you have to do academics. But nobody really took academics seriously, and and neither did I. Um, you know, you just kind of coasted in your academics. So I right. got out of school at some point kind of developed a, a, a love for reading. I think it was because I was a songwriting major and I used to read literary fiction. So literary fiction is all about characters. Yeah. And songwriting is all about characters. So I think as best I can tell, I got into reading like that stuff so that I could like improve my craft, lyric writing and stuff. So get out of Berkeley, um, go to Nashville, Tennessee, because I want to be a songwriter. I start working in a bookstore. The rule of thumb, if you go to Nashville and you want to pursue a career in either songwriting or performance or whatever, is don't get a career job. Get, you know, a job that's kind of like you don't have to think about too much. It's not going to take the energy out of you. But anyway, what I found is that I started like picking up books from the bookstore. Uh, The bookstore actually had a checkout policy. If it was a hardcover, you could check it out for like two days or whatever, uh, as long as you brought it back in the same condition. And for some reason that I still can't really quite understand I started checking out books from uh, like the philosophy section. Uh, I, I remember very vividly trying to read Albert Camus, The Myth of Sisyphus. Um, I have no idea why, I, but I remember it. <laughs> and I, I, I remember not really being able to understand it, but being like, like there's something here that's interesting. Like he's thinking about the meaning of life and he's thinking about like, you know, um, why not suicide and stuff. And this is really interesting stuff. And um so almost like going back and like reading works until I could start to understand them. And then that led to me wanting to get a master's degree um, in, uh, it was liberal studies, I guess, was the master's degree. It was from University of Richmond. Got that master's degree for no other reason than I just really wanted to study this stuff. Like there's something interesting here. Um, and then I, that worked my way all the way to a PhD. And I guess one of the things that was really interesting about that story in terms of learning is that at some point pretty early on when I was at that bookstore starting to read all this stuff, I realized very acutely that I'm reading some of the books that I was supposed to read in high school and absolutely <laughs> would have done anything to avoid reading in high school. So I'm in the, the middle I, of Tale of Two Cities right now. It's it's a hilarious example, right? It's such right. a good book, but I, yeah, I, I did all the work possible to get an A in that, that class without reading the book. Right, right. And it's amazing <laughs> how much effort you will put forth doing yeah. that. So the one I remember is the Scarlet Letter. We were supposed to read that. This was my junior year. This is when I was skipping a ton of school and we were supposed to read the Scarlet Letter. And um, I recall getting busted because my dad at some point, you know, a few weeks after we're supposed to start reading the book, uh, was talking to me and just in casual conversation, he says, so how's that Hester Prynne going? And Hester Prynne being the main character. You didn't know know that. I didn't know that (laughs) Hester Prynne was the main character. I'm like, what? So I I just said, what are you talking about, dad? You know, the Hester Prynne, how's it? So he was an English major. He started like he asking me questions to see if I, I, I yeah. didn't know any of it. But then years later at the bookstore, I'm reading this, this book and it was a while ago. So I'm trying to remember why I picked it up. And as best I can recall, it was because I was reading about American history because I just got really interested in American history when I'm working at the bookstore. 
And you can't really get through American history without hearing about the transcendental movement and Herm Herman Melville and Nathaniel sure. Hawthorne and all those. So I was like, oh, you know, every, all this book is saying that like, this is like really representative of transcendentalist writing. I should probably read this. But yeah, it became like really evident. Like I'm reading some of the books that I was supposed to read and I'm going back and reading American history when like, I, I don't remember anything from high yeah. school American history. So it's just really interesting that it was oh, really on my own that I found it. I want to drill in a little bit. The story is fascinating, Kevin. And, and I think probably a lot of people that would watch this would recognize pieces of their own story here, whether it was quite as extreme as I'm going to drop out of high school. I'm not going to go to 40 days out of the 180. I mean, right. that, that, that's pretty intense. But I think yeah. a lot of people have various levels of, of engagement when education or, or learning in their mind is something that happens to you or something that other people do to you. I wonder, you know, it clearly wasn't a personality deficiency, right? Because you were applying yourself in your, your drums and percussion in a way that's, you know, like the, the researchers now that talent code and some of these books about focused, deliberate practice, like you were doing, oh, I was that. doing that. Yeah, you absolutely. were doing that. You were in, and, and in an obsessive sort of way, I've, I've seen the same thing in, you know, esports or physical sports or, you know, music, like kids who want to be great at something and, and make a choice, kids or adults, right? Any age. Yeah, and I should and I should say that um, when I look at my drum and percussion stuff and later my songwriting stuff, I did well in both of those, and both of those were the same sort of like focused intensity. So, you know, I I made like the all state concert band, all county drums, all that stuff. I was in a whole lot of bands. Like I was one of the sought after drummers in the school. And I, again, I say that not to toot my horn, but to say that it really is true. Like if you have that focused intensity. Yeah. You know, and uh, at Berkeley, I did the same thing with songwriting and I won one of the the big songwriting awards at my senior year. Just, again, it's just a lot of, it's a lot of work and a lot of like almost obsessive work. Yeah. You can't keep your mind off it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, and, and totally the, you know, you look at the end state and you say, oh, that person must just naturally whatever, but it's never true, right? There's all this work that goes into it. And then before that work and, and throughout it, there's this question of, of motivation and, and will, right? It's like, yeah. what do I really want? Yeah. And, you know, I guess the question was, and for me, as I, as I listen to your story, academic or, or book style learning, things outside of percussion, yeah. it sounds like wasn't a, a choice that you had made. I, I don't see how that helps me in my life. And then at some point when you were ready for it, and it sounds like working at this bookstore, you know, there was this, or maybe earlier, even at, at Berkeley, as you start yeah. to write songs, um, where you, you, you made that switch. I mean, do you feel yeah. like, like how, I, I want to drill in, I guess, a little bit yeah. more and understand, did that come just from you? Was it something that you just needed to decide? Were there other humans involved in, in that moment? Well, um, so to go a little bit more in detail into the story, I think it'll answer your question a little bit. So one of the things that I can pinpoint as one of the big catalysts towards reading like philosophy and stuff like that was that um, one of my friends at the bookstore and I were talking, we were creating a book display at the, like the front of the store and we, you know, it takes about an hour and a half to do sometimes. So we're talking and this was right before the 2000 election, the Bush versus Gore election. And we were starting to talk about politics and I was expressing that I didn't really like either candidate. And he's like, well, what is your politics you think? Was, I told him and he's like, oh, you should check out this polit particular political party. It's a third party. I guess I'll mention the name. I don't want to like devolve into politics, but it was a libertarian party. Sure. Um, and as chances had it, their, uh, their um, convention was going to be televised that following week. So I like went home and I found that out and I, I started watching it and um, I really resonated with it. So I started writing down all these books. I was like, man, I should read some of this. This, this sounds like ideas that, that I would like. Uh, and that really got me into um politics and then from politics to philosophy and into history. And it was just this like rabbit hole. So I think that, yeah, it did become relevant in some way. It's, I, I still don't know. I, I try to think about like, okay, what if one of my teachers in high school would have had that same conversation with me that my friend had at the bookstore? Yeah. Would that have taken? I don't know the answer to that. There's I don't probably a teacher right now watching this saying, Hey, I would have, if you had been in class. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and maybe, I'm kidding, I'm maybe. Kidding. I, I can't rule that out, but I, I no, I think it's fascinating know. though, and I've seen that happen, you know, over and over again, where it, it is that for whatever reason, it's like a switch is flipped, and it's this becomes relevant. You know, yeah. it, it's interesting because your journey is so 
um, there's like these phases in it, right? So you went from percussion, songwriting, literature, you know, fiction, philosophy, you know, politics. Like, yeah, there's, yeah, yeah. Did, and it sounds to me from from listening to you that that it wasn't necessarily like from point A, like as the the it drummer was, who wanted to get into Berkeley, you weren't looking ahead to I'm someday going to be a professor at this new, you know. No, this, no, absolutely this, not. Yeah. Um, I well, that's one of the weird things about the story is that it's when I think back, it's just fantastic to think that I could have made it through. 13, let alone really 17 years, if you add collagen, with the idea with where I never got the sense that there was anything interesting in this academic stuff. Like literally, I just, it never even occurred yeah. to me that there was anything interesting there. Um, I even, I, I do remember trying to read a philosophy book when I was in high school and being so like over, like overwhelmed by it and stuff that I just put it aside. I probably got five pages into it. Hegel, probably. One of I think it was like Heidegger or something. It was like really <laughs> ambitious. I just, I think I wanted to be like the kind of person who would read yeah, that. Yeah. I just couldn't. Um, yeah. So it's really weird because it's, uh, I never imagined that, that I would be that kind of person. And I can't imagine that if we would go back to my high school teachers and ask them like, which one of your students, let's rank the top 50 students you think will publish like a book with an academic press. Yeah. <laughs> like who are the top 50? You wouldn't I, be able I, to. I, I can guarantee you I wouldn't have made that list. Yeah, yeah. Anyone's top 50, so I wouldn't have made that list. So this is something, and you work with like a six-year-old or an eight-year-old, which I do all the time. Yeah. It's like, it's this question of, you want them to have some something big to chase. Cause like that can be really like motivating, right? And maybe for mm -hmm. you getting into Berkeley, I mean, Berkeley, for those who don't know the school is like a prestigious, it's like you know, a, music, it's a top, it's top tier music yeah. school. Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a big goal just in and of itself. It, I mean, would you agree with like having something at least maybe you don't see the whole mountain, like someday Kevin as professor, but, but maybe it's uh, it's like this, you know, go to school for percussion at Berkeley. And then it's like, write some songs or get into the, you're going to like crack into yeah. the music scene in in Nashville or, you know, or, or whatever that, that looks like it's, it's like, I have this thing. That's a big thing that I'm working on. And then that becomes this like motivating, you know, I've compared learning to a hike. Right. And, and if you have a mountain standing in front of you, it's like, well, I'm going to hike up that mountain, which is why I take each successive step on this trail. I don't yeah. worry too much about the mountain. Like the trail's going to wind and I'm just going to follow it. But like, I'm going to focus on my next steps in the trail, but, but I know that this road leads me somewhere good that I want to be. Yeah, it sort of depends. Um, I've. It's funny because now that I'm a professor in a college of education, now I'm starting to become very skeptical about school and how schools operate. Like, I really think that it, the 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 motivation has to come from the student. Yeah. So I would agree that having big goals is a good thing, but I would be really cautious about. Well, how much is the goal that we're talking about? the kid's goal and how much of it is like an adult goal that kids yeah. have because adults want that from them. Um, and, I, and that I, there's nuance there even because it's like, okay, these adults in my life, I believe them. They're saying like, have a big goal. Here's some big goals. And I'm going to make something up that sort of, you know, I don't, I don't really know. Right. I think there's this, this worry, like what if my, what if my goals aren't, aren't good enough or, or whatever. So I don't, mm -hmm. I, I tell kids the same thing. Like don't get, too worked up around it, but find something that's interesting enough to you that you're going to like spend a lot of time working on it. Yeah. And I, I generally feel like schools, um, the way most schools are set up do doesn't really afford that ability. First of all, because you have a set curriculum that you have to, yeah. to give kids generally speaking. So like, you know, I have, I have t students who are teacher candidates come up with really amazing, innovative, fun looking lessons about mapping geographic coordinates, but in the back of my head. And sometimes if I'm, if, if I'm bold enough, I find a very polite way to ask the student, well, what happens to the kid who isn't interested in mapping coordinates? Like, because you're going to, like, you're going to have those kids. And at that yeah. point, there's a pretty fixed limit to what you're going to be able to do. Like maybe you could get them enticed with a game but they're going to be enticed with the game, not mapping coordinates. And the goal is to get them enticed with mapping coordinates. It's like an invitation to care. So, so one way to do education is like, I care about this thing and I invite you also to care about it, but recognize yeah. your choice. In but then you have to be prepared for the child to say like, I reject your invitation. Yeah. And, yeah, and that's scary okay with that. And un unfortunately schools don't generally offer the flexibility, like because teachers have this message of, okay, but you have to get students to add fractions today. 
So yeah. if they reject your invitation of like, isn't this exciting adding fractions? Uh, and I say that with a little bit of sarcasm, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's so one of the things that I really worry about with my students is that a lot of teachers get the message of, you know, all it really takes is just really get to know your kids' interests. I hear that a lot. Like my students come in and say, you know, people are telling me, I just get to know your kids' interests. I'm like, that's, that's great. I'm not against getting to know your kids' interests, but you also have to realize that will only go so far. Right. Because you have 30 kids in a class. Every one of them has unstable interests. I mean, they're 12, 13, 14. You don't have the same interest all the way through right. the year. Right. And, and on any given day, you're only going to be able to connect any given lesson to some of those kids' interests. It's just unreal to think that if you just get to know everyone's interest, you can find a lesson that fits everyone. I did. You know, when I was a teacher, I did. In my, in my luckiest moments, I found those lessons that like somehow managed to hit everyone. So it's possible, but that's, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's way more possible that you have lessons that either hit no one's interests or that hit a few kids' interests. Right. And my worry is that when we tell teachers that, it makes the teacher think if the kids aren't interested in adding fractions with my lesson, it's my fault. Yeah, which isn't true. Which, yeah, I don't think it is true. I think it's it's just the fault of the system. It's how the system operates. Yeah, lots we could get into about structural things and, and system design, but um, looks like we already used up our, our 20 minutes. Kevin, thank you so much for being willing to have this conversation about you as a learner. It's fascinating to hear your story. Oh, thank you. Take care.